Good morning. Happy Sunday, church. I am so glad you are all here with us. I hope you're staying healthy. hope you're staying safe. And God bless you guys. It is so excited to be together. Listen, I hope you got your devices. Go ahead and check in. Let us know who's here. And uh, tell us where you're streaming from, where you're watching this. Are you, uh, are you in some city way out of town? And uh, leave your comments. Talk to each other. Leave your prayer requests. We want to make this an interactive time, okay? And uh, it's just we're going to get together and form the church and just relax and have an awesome time just worshiping God. I hope you already have, and uh, we're fired up. In the words of the great theologian Clark Griswold, we're all in this together, and I'm glad we are. So in a minute, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to pray, and after that, I'm going to give you 60 seconds to grab your coffee, grab your Bible, uh, grab your digital notepad if you like to take notes. And for those who feel led to give, you'll also have a minute to give your offerings and your tithes to the Lord uh, if the Lord leads you to do that as well. You'll see the online giving link come up and our mailing address. Uh, for those who like to write checks, you can send those in. I've got mine right here. I'm about to give my offering as well. And I just want to thank you guys for being so faithful, so generous, um, and sustaining the ministry during this time, helping us meet people's needs. It's a crazy time, and the need is great, and you guys have been so faithful and so generous. So God bless you. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you to worship you this morning through all the chaos through all the uncertainty, and I thank you that you are our unmovable rock, our foundation, our fortress. Lord, as we bring our gifts before you now, we thank you. You are the giver of every good thing in our life. And now, Lord, would you open our hearts to hear your word? Holy Spirit, be our teacher this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'll see you right back here in 60 seconds. Amen. See if you could finish this lyric. The devil went down to Georgia. He was looking for a soul to steal. He was in a bind because he was way behind, and he was, oh, yeah. I heard you. Good job. Yes. You know it. Now, what if I told you there's another well-known story about the devil going down to Alabama? But this time, it wasn't to steal a soul. It was for a yard sale. Not sure it's a true story. It's a well-known well story. You might have heard it. But if you haven't, it goes like this. The devil is having this yard sale, and he's got all these tools laid out. And each one of them is marked with its price tag and what it does. And they're crazy tools, tools that you might recognize, tools like lust and envy and hatred, deceit and murder and pride. Every evil tool that the devil uses was laid out 
and priced accordingly to how often he used them and how effective they were. However, there was this one tool that was way off by itself. It was a very simple looking tool, but it was well worn. And one of the buyers came up and noticed it, and he was shocked when he looked and he saw the price on it was so much higher than all the other tools. Yet it looked so simple. It didn't even look really that impressive. So he took the tool and he went over to the devil and he said, what is this tool? What is this all about? Why is this tool priced so high? And the devil grinned and he says, ah, yes, that one, that tool is my favorite. And the reason it's so badly worn is because I use it on almost everyone. Wow. The guy was really surprised and he says, I, I, I don't understand. It just looks so, so simple. And he says, you know, it's more useful to me than every other tool combined because it has a secret. The secret is nobody knows it belongs to me. So I'm able to use this tool without them even knowing where it's coming from. In fact, it's better than every other tool. And once I stir up a storm in their life, I can pretty much have my way with them. But it looks so simple. What, what, do you, what do you call this tool? This tool goes by many names. Doubt, despair, fear. But I call it the tool of discouragement. And I use it all the time. In fact, maybe you're sitting at home on your sofa right now and you feel like that tool is being used on you. Maybe you've seen it used on neighbors, on friends. This, these past two weeks, man, there is no doubt that this deadly tool is still in wide use. And the devil is using that, looking for any opening to bring you down, to, to take away your courage and your faith and your will to stay in the fight during these days. The good news is, and you know I always have good news, you and I don't have to give in to discouragement. We don't have to give in to despair. God has some tools of his own. And today I'm so excited to be able to talk about how we navigate these storms that we find ourselves in. Today we're going to talk about an epic storm. Even in the middle of a pandemic, even when bad news and chaos seem to overwhelm us, God's word has something to tell us. And as we look at an epic storm, in fact, I thought about what a, what a cool name for storm was, and I thought about, you know, hurricane, and I thought about the tempest, and when I googled it, all I could find was this picture of this video game from the 80s when we all played. Anybody play this game? Anybody ever play this game? Yeah, this this, I used to love this game, but I was terrible at it. So I was so mad. My older brothers would be like just killing it, like quarter after quarter, just going up to like level 38 and got 700,000 points. And my high score was like seven. It was, it, I was so mad at it. So today we are going to talk about a tempest, but not this one. And we are going to talk about a storm and a hurricane. And it's a deadly enemy that wants to take you out of the game. And just like the tool, the name of this storm is discouragement. And it's everywhere. You know, and if you were here Wednesday night, we did an online Bible study. It was awesome. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and all your positive feedback. We're going to keep doing those. So spread the word Wednesday night at 630. We talked about an Old Testament hero, Isaiah. And then we also got to go into the New Testament and talk about one of my heroes of the faith, the great apostle Paul. And today we get to dovetail on that and see how he handles major storms in his life. And there's such great lessons for us in this. Now, I want to set the context for what we're about to read and give you a warning. Brace yourself. This story is so action-packed, it reads like, uh, like, a, like a spy, like Frank Peretti's This Present Darkness. Y'all remember that? It reads like that. Or if you're a movie buff, this is like Fast and Furious Part 29. It's got The Rock in it. It's got Vin Diesel, and you know all these guys are coming out. It is so Fast and Furious. So, so let me set the scene in the context of what we're about to read. Over in Acts chapter 27... Paul has been arrested. He's a prisoner, he's in chains, and he's on board a ship, and he's headed for Italy. And he's going all over the place, and his case has to be heard before Caesar himself. But something happens along the way. He encounters a storm, and not just any storm. He encounters the mother of all storms, this huge cyclone that is so fierce, so destructive, it even has its own name. It's called Eurachlodon, and it is fierce. And when this storm hit, Paul had every reason in the world to be afraid, to panic, and yeah, to get discouraged. Because Eurachlodon was like a category four or category five hurricane that we're used to seeing over here. 
But the last thing we would ever do in a hurricane like a Cat 4 or Cat 5 is hop on a small wooden boat and sail into it. But that's exactly what Paul has to do. Not by his own choice. Remember, he's arrested. He's in chains, and he's on this tiny wooden boat. And if you've ever read Acts 27 and on to 28, this storm just keeps coming. It's like adversity never ends. Maybe you can identify with that. And we read some of the verses give us a hint. They say the sailors couldn't even turn the ship into the wind. The ship was finally, they just gave up. They just said, just run free. Just let it go before the gale. And then the hole started to creak and crack, and they were thought it was going to explode and split apart. So they tied ropes all the way around the hull of the ship, hoping that it would strengthen it. And they were so afraid of being driven into these reefs and these sandbars all up and down the coast. The ship was about to break apart. They did something so drastic, so unheard of, they literally dropped their anchor in the middle of a storm, hoping it would slow them down. You don't do that. This trip was, it should have been a simple trip. Look at this map, and I want you to see just how crazy this journey was. It starts off way over here in Jerusalem, goes all the way through. They should have stayed at Crete over in Fairhaven, but they didn't. And as you see, as they go further and further, look where the ship gets lost in the storm. This storm is crazy, and it goes on and on. All night long, into the next day, gale force winds begin to batter the ship, and the crew begins throwing cargo overboard. You don't do that unless you are desperate. They start getting rid of their food and anything that's not essential. And the storm rages on for so many days. It blots out the sun, the stars. They've lost all hope. In fact, these seasoned sailors were seasick. They said they were so sick and so distraught that no one had eaten in several days. Okay, so that's the context. And this is where we pick up the story already in progress. Look with me in verse 21, Acts 27. Finally, Paul called the crew together, and he said, Men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. You would have avoided all this damage, all this loss. But, take courage, none of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of God, the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, came and stood beside me. And he said, Don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more... God, in his goodness, has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. Wow. How awesome is that? What a great assurance. And then Paul says this really bold statement. I love it. He says, so take courage, for I believe God. It will be just as he said. So you think, all right, this is great, right? The soldiers are high five, and we're going to make it. It's going to be awesome. We're not going to have any problem. This can't be too bad. And then Paul goes on to add, Almost like a comical footnote, he says this. He says, but we will be shipwrecked on an island, okay? So we're not going to die, but you're going to feel like we're dying. We're going to shipwreck. It's going to be in the storm. It's going to be terrible. And sure enough, when the morning happened, the sun, I don't know how much they could see, but they had ran into a reef, and the bow had gotten stuck fast, and the stern was being repeatedly hammered, and the entire ship broke apart. Well, here's something we don't think about, because not many of us are sailors like this. But these soldiers on the boat, they had a new problem. They knew that none of these prisoners better escape. None of them better swim away. Because back then, if your prisoner escaped, you were killed in his place. How would you like that? You were killed in a place. So guess what the soldiers did? They talked to their commanding officer and said, you know what we need to do? We need to kill them all. Kill every prisoner on the boat. Then they can't escape. And they were seriously going to do this. This was actually an accepted practice back then. Just kill them. That way they can't be punished for escaping. But their commanding officer, who wanted to spare Paul, says, no, you're not going to do that. He ordered everybody to swim to shore. If you could swim, make for land. And if you can't, grab some of this debris, these planks, and doggy paddle all the way over to the shoreline. What a storm. It was crazy. Do you feel the chaos? And as we look around, be honest, man, it kind of feels like we're in a storm now. We got a huge storm called coronavirus that's shut the club down. I mean, hardly anything's open. And you look around and you think, man, it's it's like life has changed overnight. And we wonder how many smaller storms are coming behind it. Is your 401k a storm? Is your is your health? Is your business? You know, there's so many things. Your family, you can't go see, you can't check on people. There's so many little storms we don't even know that are out there. So maybe you can identify with Paul right now. You know, Paul had every reason to feel discouraged. So if you're feeling like that right now, let's stop, and I want you to hear me. You're not alone. That's normal. 
We all feel that way to some degree. I'm sure there were times where Paul wasn't even thinking he would survive this storm because it was brutal. But Paul, look at him. He exhibits this faith that is incredible. It sustains him through the whole ordeal. In fact, in the midst of their darkest hour, Paul rises up and he says clearly and confidently three simple words that I absolutely love in verse 25. He says, I believe God. Isn't that awesome? And there it is. That's the choice we all have in the middle of our storm. Right there. Believe God. You can believe the storm or you can believe God. Frankly, I'm sure it looked pretty hopeless and bleak when all these storms were hitting Paul and all these things were going around. They're throwing stuff overboard. They're not eating. They're being hammered by these waves. Paul looks at his circumstances and he chooses to believe God over the storm. And I don't know about you, but that's the kind of faith I want to have. I want to look at my storm and realize how big my God is, not the other way around. So as we think of the storms in our life, these hurricanes of discouragement, these tempests, I want us to consider a few things about the nature of storms so we can recognize them and see how Paul handles them. And then at the end, I want to share a couple practical things that we can all do when these storms inevitably come. The first thing we need to do is this. Notice the suddenness of the storm. This storm, man, it came out of nowhere. That sound familiar? Think about that. Y'all, just two weeks ago, we were all joking that the biggest problem we faced was the time change, the full moon, and Friday the 13th, right? You remember it? You sit at home. I see you. You got your little footy pajamas on. You're sitting on the sofa. Yeah, yeah, you. This, is, this was our biggest problem two weeks ago. And now, y'all, that seems like forever ago, doesn't it? I can't, can't even remember things so simple causing us such, oh, it's a panic and stuff. But look how sudden things change. The world is so different. Just like Paul, there was no warning for the storm. The storm came so quickly, there was nothing they could do. And that's how storms are in our physical life, our spiritual life, our emotional life. It could be a storm maybe totally unrelated to, to what you're feeling with the quarantine in the world. Maybe you got a, a personal storm. You know, sometimes all it takes is a phone call that you didn't want, an email, a text out of the blue, some tragedy occurs, and boom, man, it's like Eurachlodon shows up on your doorstep. The storm of discouragement right there. The next thing we need to notice is the severity of the storm. This storm was so bad that everyone's lives were considered to be in grave danger. Does this, does this sound like it's written for today? Everyone thought there was a chance they're going to die. It was so severe, notice what they did. They threw everything that they once considered valuable overboard. They were even throwing toilet paper overboard. Well, they might not be it, but you, don't miss this. Storms have a way of revealing what really matters. That alone, that's not one of your notes, but it should be. Storms reveal what's really important. When the trials come, man, they tell you what really matters in life, don't they? There's a meme going around that I think it shows literally like four rolls of toilet paper all stacked up. And there's a little sign on it that says, we'll trade for beachfront condo or a Mercedes. That's where we are. Who would have thought that would be important just two weeks ago? Something as simple as toilet paper or bottled water. Things that we once held as important are now no longer as important as we once thought. Then there's the senselessness of the storm. Here's Paul, whom God has already said, listen, you have got to go stand trial in Rome. Then all of a sudden this storm comes. And Paul has to, you know, he's human. He has to be thinking, how can I get to Rome if we die? If this ship explodes, it disintegrates under the weight of these crashing waves. How do I get there? Remember, Paul wasn't doing anything. He wasn't like Jonah. He wasn't running. He wasn't living in rebellion. In fact, he was trying to do what God asked him to do. Notice that the storm comes while Paul is doing and fulfilling God's purpose for his life. So what gives? You ever feel that way? God, why is this coming? I thought I was doing your will. God, how come you, you told me to do this and I got this storm coming and this is all these problems breathing down my neck. And, oh, did I mishear you, God? Did, where are you? you know, did, did I do something wrong or are you dropping the ball? You know, we have all these doubts because it seems so senseless. They set sail and all of a sudden Eurachlodon comes, this horrible storm comes, and on the surface it doesn't make sense. How could this storm possibly be God's will? That's a loaded question. You ever ask that? But notice one more thing. 
Notice how Paul responds. Notice his steadfastness in the middle of a storm. Oh, I love this about Paul. In spite of the chaos, in spite of the panic, and all the crashing waves around him, and the roaring winds and all the stuff, and it's pirates of the Caribbean going crazy. And Notice that Paul never allows the storm to throw him off course. He knew that our never-changing God was still in control. He knew that God had called him, and he said, you will go safely to Rome, one way or another. Why? Because God had promised him that. He said, you're going to go to Rome. In the middle of the storm, Paul believed, and he clung to God's promises. So, you know, I got to ask, do we, do we trust God that much? Paul didn't even question it, yet he had every right to be rattled and freaked out and discouraged. But he would tell us today, don't let your current storm, don't let your problems and your circumstance get you off course. If God has called you, he will provide. Don't get discouraged. Several months ago, I took my family on an adventure, and I regret it. It was a little adventure called camping. And on this trip, man, we loaded up the family, and against my better judgment, we decided to take on the adventure of a lifetime. We loaded up everything in the back of the van, and we went way out. I mean, we drove for minutes all the way to Jordan Lake. And we're driving around, and y'all, I'm going around trying to find the perfect spot, and there it was. The light came down, a dove landed on my shoulder, and they sang me a song. It was this beautiful spot right by the lake. Like you could see the water. And right next to the lake, right next to our spot was the bathhouse. Just like I like it. All the bathrooms with the showers and the hand soap and the hot water and all the things, air conditioning probably, all the things you need to make a camping trip great. And I couldn't believe that no one had taken the spot. So, man, I pull in, I back it up. I say, guys, you stay in the car. Amy, you help me. First things first, we get out the boom box. And we go over to our site and we plug in the boom box. Yes, I get the site that has the power. Otherwise, I mean, what's the point? How are you going to have air conditioning? So I plug in the boom box, crank up some striper. I kid you not. I go back to the thing, open the trunk, and I'm starting to pull out the uh, rolled up tent. I come, I drop it next to the boom box. No sooner had I turned around than Amy looks at me and says, what's that all over your socks? I look down and I see black spots all over my white socks. And then she says, what's on the tent? You just set that, what's on the boom box? And we look, y'all, it was hundreds of ticks. Blood, thirsty, disgusting ticks. I cannot tell you how fast I danced. Patting those things, trying to get them off. Run, save yourself, get in the van. We ran, we got in the van, we threw the stuff in, we're knocking all the ticks off a can, I unplugged striper, and I throw it in the van, y'all, and we bail. That whole beautiful camping trip lasted nine whole minutes. Those blood-sucking, thirsty ticks disgust me. And just like a nasty, bloodthirsty tick, a storm of discouragement buries its fangs into your soul, you know what I'm talking about, and it doesn't seem to let go until you are dry and empty until it puts out your fire, until it dampens your spirit and your passion and it drains your energy. And finally, its goal is it wants to stop you dead in your tracks so that you give up on what God is calling you to do. Sound familiar? So when you face discouragement, okay, there's two things I want you to keep in mind that'll help all of us. The first one is this. Know that discouragement doesn't discriminate. It didn't just seek you out. It is indiscriminate. Everyone feels it. We all face it. Even the strongest among us will find ourselves under its weight at times. Just live long enough, and you know it's true. Some of you are probably nodding right now. You're texting going, that's me. I'm in the middle of Hurricane Eurachlodon right now. Man, I get it. I get it. We're all in this together. Even spiritual giants that we looked up to all our life, like the great Martin Luther, you know, David Jeremiah, uh, you t- Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, the one that preachers look up to. All of them admitted to serious times of discouragement. Listen to this quote from Charles Spurgeon himself. Listen to this honesty. He says, quote, I wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy the depths of despair and discouragement I often feel for weeks or months at a time. Wow. So you're not alone. Discouragement doesn't discriminate. And the next thing we need to remember is Discouragement is not a sin. 
Somebody needs to hear that. You sitting there in your little flannel pajamas, you need to hear that. Discouragement is not a sin. It's not a weakness. It's not a moral shortcoming. Remember, Paul was doing nothing wrong when this storm came. You need to grasp that. Paul wouldn't do anything wrong. It's not punishment. There was no sin in his life that we unconfessed, that we know of. He wasn't doing anything wrong, but the storm came anyway. So know that. You're not alone. It's not a sin. This, this is not a symptom that your faith is somehow faltering all of a sudden. Okay? So cut yourself some slack. And just know, in this crazy era that we find ourselves, sometimes discouragement happens. Sometimes it's simply a warning light that maybe you're a little depleted emotionally, you know, spiritually, or maybe physically. Maybe you haven't been taking care of yourself. Maybe it's been lack of sleep. It could, this could be a warning light for, for any of us. Everyone can feel discouraged at some point, even those we hold up as spiritual giants. Look at this quote. The great Billy Graham said, the Christian life is not a constant high. I have my moments of deep discouragement. What? Billy Graham? I got to go to God in prayer with tears in my eyes and say, Lord, forgive me. Help me. So know that. You're not alone. You're not a defective Christian. You're not a loser. In fact, look at your neighbor right now on your chair or sitting on your sofa and say, you are not a loser. Who said anything about being a loser? <laughs> you are not a loser, okay? The warning is this. What can start out as just a simple bout of discouragement can quickly blossom into a full-on spiritual defeat. And that's exactly where the enemy wants us. So we have to be aware of that. So as we navigate the storms of life, let me give you some of the warning signs that you may be mentally, physically, or spiritually depleted, okay? The first one is guilt, all right? That means if you start hearing in your head things like, you failed. Man, I blew it. What good am I? I, I can't cut it. I'm not meant to do this. I'm not good at this. If you start hearing these, these things of, of, of guilt and shame, who am I? I can't believe I did that. And you start feeling that voice of condemnation, okay? That may be a warning sign that uh, maybe you're a little more depleted. Maybe discouragement is on your doorstep. The second one is this pity. Some of the voices you may hear for this are things like, man, you poured so much effort into that project and no one even noticed. You spent so much time on that event or this family function and no one even said thank you. Sound familiar? Maybe you've been there. Does no one care? Poor me. I was just trying to help. Those are words of pity. The second or the third warning sign is doubt. You start asking, man, am I even the right person for this job? I'm starting to wonder if I have the skills or the temperament to even pull this off. Can I really make this job work? Can I really make this marriage work? When you start having doubt, you know, am I even on the right career path? I climbed this mountain and now you're telling me, oh, maybe I should have climbed that mountain. <laughs> you start questioning everything. You know, how do I get here? What is going on? Those, those feelings of doubt. The fourth warning sign is anger. Oh, that's it. I'm over it. I am done. D-O-N-E. I'm out of here. No one cares. Apparently, everyone else is just a bunch of self-absorbed whiners, and I am done with them. And you get angry. You probably wouldn't if you were in your normal, proper state of mind with the proper perspective. But when you're depleted and discouragement is at your door, you start saying and thinking some of the things. And the last thing is despair. <sighs> well, okay. If no one else cares, why should I? You know what? I give up. I give up. I got better things to do with my time. See ya. Sayonara, losers. Peace out. Mwah. You ever think that? You ever felt like that? All right. Let, now, let me show you how sneaky the devil is here, okay? Are you ready for your hidden gem of the week? This is, this is so good. When discouragement shows up like that, and it starts to unpack all its baggage right there on your doorstep, the next thing that happens and this is where some of us are right now, okay? So lean in. The next thing that happens is we begin to get so focused on the storm, so focused on our problems, so focused on our struggle. We are so, we got that furrowed brow and we are so myopically tunnel vision on our problems that now we are blinded to anything good happening around us. You know what I'm saying? We can't see anything good. We're so caught up in this storm. We're so negative. We can't think of anything good that's happening in our life. Everything is awful. Everything's terrible. Ever been there? Yeah, we've all felt that. And when that happens, man, the temptation to quit or give in to the storm becomes so easy and so attractive. So be aware, okay? Discouragement 
it changes our perception. It makes us see things that really aren't the way they are. But the good news is this. You are not a powerless victim. You are more than a conqueror. And the next thing we need to see is we need to separate ourselves. We need to remove ourselves from these sources of discouragement. There's nothing wrong with that. Separate yourself. Obviously, you can't fully separate yourself from every problem or every virus that comes around, although we've done a good job of trying to. But you can zero in on the smaller storms that are causing you struggles, that are causing you pain, things that are bringing you down. You have mental permission to take a temporary vacation from the negativity in your life, from all this discouragement, okay? Negativity is like a virus. And sometimes, man, you just gotta, you just gotta realize I'm separating myself from this source of discouragement. Jesus himself tells his disciples something very similar. He says this in Mark 6, 31. He says, come away by yourselves, man. Get away. Come to a secluded place and rest a while. And the last thing that's so important is to just enjoy some simple things in life. In other words, embrace those simple things that bring you joy. Some of you are doing so good during this quarantine. I'm so proud of you. I see the things you're posting. Man, you are killing it. You are doing great. You're being with your family. You're making up for lost time. You're reclaiming the home. You're doing bike rides and, and picnics in the backyard. And I see these pictures. You're playing games. You're not having a fight after Monopoly. Why is that just my family that fights during that game? And you have all these incredible things going. That's awesome. Embrace whatever brings you joy. You know, if that's something that, that, that brings you closer to, to peace, do it. Because when you do it, nothing short of a miracle happens. You turn the tables on discouragement and negativity, and discouragement gets a panic attack. And it flees, and you feel your spirits start to lift. When you take time to enjoy what God has given you, the simple things, it reminds you that you are a human being. You are not a human doing. You weren't created just to be an endless busybody. Coming back to the simple things reminds us of what we need and what we don't need. And that is so clear for us right now. Look at 1 Timothy 6. I love this powerful truth. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Notice that word contentment. We brought nothing into the world. We could take nothing out. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Amen. That is awesome. And some of you are finding that right now. And that's awesome. Good for you. Taking time to enjoy the simple things in life. Man, it doesn't change the storm you're in. But I'll tell you this. It changes the way you see your storm, perspective, having a godly perspective. When you separate yourself from that source of discouragement and you begin to experience simple joys again, it rejuvenates you. A godly and content heart is powerful. You know why? Because a contented heart is a calm sea in the midst of all these storms. And it's a beautiful thing. So if you find yourself swallowed by the storm of discouragement this morning, I want you to hear me. Know this. The sun is still there. It may be covered with clouds, but no storm lasts forever. The sun will break through and the heaviness will lift. The Soviet Union, back under communist control, was a brutal place. And it was not a friend of Christianity. And a Christian missionary was smuggling Bibles into Soviet bloc countries, behind the Iron Curtain. And they had an elaborate network made up where they would smuggle hundreds of Bibles all the time. They had a pipeline and safe houses and all kinds of secret contacts. And they were desperately trying to get the Word of God to a place that so needed it. And they had come up with all kinds of methods to hide Bibles, sometimes in the hidden pockets in their clothes, sometimes it would be in secret compartments in their luggage, or even in their cars and their trucks. And it was such an elaborate, amazing thing. And one day, this missionary was stopped at a communist border, and something was different. They began to search his car far more rigorously than ever before. And he knew something was wrong because they started to tear this thing apart. And they were ruthless. And then it happened. They found the hidden compartment in a false gas tank. And when they opened it up, they found over 200 copies of God's Word. And the missionary knew what was next. And sure enough, they arrested him on the spot. And they took him and they threw him in that dark hole called solitary confinement. And it was awful. 
And they put him down there, and they hardly fed him anything, just enough to keep him alive. And they kept him awake for 42 hours at a stretch in an attempt to break him as they interrogate him, trying to get him to reveal things like, who's helping you smuggle these Bibles? Where is your safe house? What routes do you use? What are your smuggling techniques? All these things, but he was so strong. In fact, I bet he surprised his captors with his resilience and his strength in this storm that he was facing. But the interrogations went on and on for days. And then something happened. Finally, after a brutal and relentless stretch of days, he finally broke. And he spilled everything. All the secrets, all the names, all the safe house locations, all the smuggling techniques, everything, much to his deep regret and his shame. I heard a special force operative Uh, I'm talking the toughest of the toughest of the military guys, said, listen, everybody breaks. Everybody. It's just a matter of how long you can hold out. And this Christian man held out a long time. When he was finally released, many days later, he was safely back in his own country. One of his Bible smuggling leaders came to him and met with him, and they hugged, and they cried, and man, they talked for a long time. And the leader said, man, I don't blame this guy at all. I don't harbor any bad feelings. Everybody, he knew he'd been through so much and we would all break like that. But eventually he had to ask the question that everyone wanted to know. He said, listen, you are the toughest, strongest man I know, physically, mentally, spiritually. How did they break you? His answer was so revealing. He said, I got discouraged. I got discouraged. They isolated me. They wouldn't let me sleep. I started to get confused. I was tired. I felt alone. They kept me awake, and I was disoriented. And the next thing I know, my perspective was way off. And eventually, all the resistance I thought I had began to crumble. Church, that is what the enemy wants to do to every follower of Christ, to isolate you to discourage you, to tell you you're alone, to tell you you don't have what it takes, to tell you you're not a conqueror, you're not a winner. All these things. He wants to discourage and isolate and overwhelm you. So during this quarantine time, if you find yourself overwhelmed by the storm of discouragement, know this, the sun is still there. No storm lasts forever. The sun will break through. The heaviness will lift. Stay plugged into him. Stay plugged into his word. We need each other during this time. Now more than ever, I'm so grateful we have this community that we can come and we can text and comment to each other and encourage each other. I know Paul had to think, man, this storm's never going to end. I'm never going to get where I'm supposed to go. I'm not going to reach my destination. But look at the faith he exhibits in his darkest hour. He stands up and he says these three great words, I believe God. And that's awesome. By the way, I didn't tell you how his story ended. He goes on to Rome, and for the next two years, he leads countless people to faith in Christ. Countless. And it is a beautiful thing. But hear me, none of it would have happened without his storm, without that shipwreck. So here's your challenge this week, and I'll let you go. During this quarantine time, anytime you feel the storm clouds of discouragement start to gather. You see the sky darken. You feel that distant rumble of thunder. Anytime you know that that discouragement is coming, I want you, like Paul, to stop and declare with boldness and authority, I believe God is bigger than this storm. And you keep your eyes on him and you lean into him. Let me pray for you right now. Wherever you are, would you just close your eyes, just bow with me? doesn't matter where you are. And just listen, let me, let me pray for you, okay? Father, like Paul, we do believe you. We believe, God, help us during this time to cling to you, to have your heavenly perspective, to not be so focused on the storm and all the crashing waves and all the chaos that we forget you are the maker of the waves. You are sovereign. You hold the world in your hands. So God, we trust you in the good times, and we trust you in the tough times. We know that you will never waste pain, That you can take what seems so weird, so random, so dark, and you can somehow make it to serve your divine purpose. So we trust you. We may not understand it until we see you face to face, but Lord, we trust you. 
and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's church said, amen and amen. Thank you guys so much for being here today. I hope it's been an inspiration. I hope this time together has lifted your spirits. I love being with you, and uh, I'm so proud of you. Keep loving each other. Keep serving each other, your neighbor. Check on each other. And I invite you back here Wednesday night uh, between myself and Pastor Bill. We'll be alternating however long this goes, and we'll be sharing Bible studies live Wednesday nights and on Sunday mornings as well, okay? Now, we're going to sign off, but feel free to stay here. Stay online if you like. Keep chatting. Keep sharing comments and pictures. I love to see those, okay? I love you guys. I'm praying for you, and I hope you have a great rest of your Sunday. God bless you.